when you have two wonderful personalities and people, you know this conversation and this program is going to be really good, entertaining. We're going to talk about what are we going to talk about? Writing groups, literary support, existing stereotypical Latinx representation. We're going to have some readings. We're going to ask each other questions. This is going to be incredible. Um, but first, I want to thank all of you on Zoom and YouTube. And we have some people here. Thank you for taking the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking this journey with us as we start to have programs back in the library. But it's not, it's for us, we're proud to have good people, good local artists, writers, creators um, to go along with us and to, and to do this with us. Uh, for Latinx Month, for Viva, we're proud to have uh, the Masset Michelle. We have, I ha should have had in the background, some other programs coming up this month. We have a lot of Viva Latinx programs. October is also Filipino American History Month. Um, but enough of me. Let me start with our land acknowledgement. The San Francisco Public Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramitish Ohlone peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as first peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramitish community. Tomas Moniz is a father, writer, teacher, and performer. His debut novel, Big Familia, was a finalist for the Penn Hemingway Debut Novel 2020 Award, a finalist for a Lambda 2020 Award for Bisexual Fiction, and a finalist for the Forward Review Indies Award, Indies Award. In July 2019, he released a chapbook, All Friends Are Necessary, and shortly after that, he joined us here in this room. Uh, a chapbook, All Friends Are Necessary, with Mason Jarrett Press. He edited Rad Dad, Rad Families, and the kids' book Collaboration Colaboración. He is an artist affiliate at the Headland Center for the Arts 2020-2021. He's represented by Eleanor Jackson of Dunno, Carlson, and Lerner Literary Agency. That's the last. <laughs> Michelle Cruz Gonzalez is an English professor and author of the memoir the Spit Boy Rule, Tales of a Chicana in a Female Punk Band, which is taught in colleges and universities all over the US. She has essays and fiction in anthologies by Putnam, PM Press, Steel Press, and Literary Education, and she's published in Me Too. She recently completed a satirical novel about near future California, that secedes from the U.S. and forces intermarriage between whites and, Me and Mexicanos for the purpose of creating a race of beautiful, intelligent, hardworking people. And she is currently at work on a screenplay. I can't wait. I'm going to kick it over to you two. Great the night. Again, thank you for having us here. We're really uh, happy to be in person and on YouTube. Hello, YouTube. YouTube and Zoom and everything. I know, right? It's uh, it's nice to be, you know, I appreciate the last year and a half being able to connect on Zoom and things like YouTube. It's really nice to be in a room with people. So thank you for coming. Uh, we're going to have a kind of casual event tonight. We're going to start off with a couple uh, short readings from Big Familia. I think you're reading from what you tell us. Boy Roll. Stick Boy Roll, excellent. And then I thought we would just kind of have a conversation about some various topics. Um, obviously, if there's any, we're good with spontaneity, so if any questions come up in our conversation, feel free to jump on in. Otherwise, we'll kind of at the end, uh, if anyone has anything else to add to it or say, we'll, we'll go from there. Um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and start the readings. I'm going to read from, it's a chapter I haven't actually read before. Uh, it's one of these chapters I, I wrote this book and it was a, uh, initially a bunch of short stories and so 
in the editing process, I had to kind of add a lot of the backstory to the characters. And so it, it comes from one of these chapters. And all I think you need to know is that the uh, main character, Juan, is with his uh, boyfriend, Jared, and they're having dinner with uh, Juan's daughter, Stella, who's working on her application to colleges. And I'm still traumatized from doing that with my own daughter. So I put a lot of that into here. So anyways, I think this will fit our evening uh, conversation tonight. Um, so Stella says, I, and this is about her application into college. I wrote about being the child of teen parents, about you and mom. I'm not sure what's the point of the piece, uh, that teens should or should not have kids. She says neither. The point is the perspective it gave me, Stella's and regret. What perspective is that, I ask? Today, I tried to show how I learned things like empathy and nonconformity and patience. Patience with us, me and your mother? I ask a bit too defensively. She says, you have to be a little bit cavalier to have kids at 18. I can't imagine a child right now. Probably a good thing, Jared whispers loudly. <laughs> cavalier. That line and smirking. Why not write about being Chicanx, I ask. I know I'm showing off a little bit, and my daughter nods in approval with my use of the word, but I can't quite imagine my father hearing that word yet. So it doesn't feel right to say aloud. Because I'm not. Not really. How are you not really? You're half. I'm half white, too. Jared adds, Obama's half white, but he's black, period, right? But I don't really fit in with the other Latinx students in my school. I can't speak Spanish. I feel like my roots are something I learned about from a book or from grandma. That's your father's fault, Chica. My, uh, I can teach you anytime you want to speak Spanish, Jared adds, who speaks Spanish better than I do. Shut up, I say, eyeballing him. Dad, what could I say? That I'm Bocha, a mixed race white girl, a product of American colonialism and cultural amnesia? I feel like I'm faking it. Damn, Jared says. Yes, you should say exactly that. But to be honest, and this is a bit of honesty from one symbolic pocho to another, we're all fronting a little bit. We're all learning about who we all want to be and who we are. The difference lies between fronting and lying, especially to ourselves. You can't front on yourselves, on yourself. I want to get off this subject quickly, speaking Spanish and family. So I say, you wrote about me and your mom. What did you say? I'm stuck, actually, because I feel like I don't know anything about you guys as young parents. I try not to sound irritated when I say, well, you could just ask us. Stella immediately then sits upright and takes out her laptop and says, okay, fine. She asks, how did you and mom fall in love, even fall in love? I say, falling in love is easy. I say, staying in love is the work. And I still love your mother. I do. I just, you know, needed something else, something different. I don't know how else to explain it. Obviously, like you needed to see men. She gestures in this game show kind of way to Jared, who in a game show kind of way bows. I look to her. I look at her like, I can't believe you said something vulgar. She, back, she looks back at me and says, don't try and deny it. I say, yes, that was some of it, but not all of it. Your mom knew about me, man. Okay, stop. No, I say loudly and a bit too sharply. I wasn't really angry, irritated for sure, but something in me, something in me feels hot and urgent. I say, you want to know about me, about your mother, then you have to learn to listen to the whole story. You have to see your parents as people too, like you, as hard as that is. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, well, of course, this issue of Spanish comes up, you know, and it is, it is, you know, at, at the heart in some cases um, of Latinx representation in writing. And sometimes people who didn't grow up speaking Spanish don't always feel like they can claim it or claim even being Latinx. Um, and that's kind of what this, this section of my memoir is about. And it's from a chapter called My Body is Mine. And I'll just start here. Although I looked quite different from the rest of Spit Boy, my ethnicity didn't often come up in conversation, not in the Bay Area. In the 1990s, people were still trying to be colorblind, to not see race or to pretend not to see it as the case may be. It wasn't polite to talk about race, and so I didn't really talk about it. But one conversation sticks out in my mind. What's your name? We had just played a show and a friend of Karen's had come to see us play. 
Well, Thomas, I said, it was an unusual question. Your last name is Gonzalez? Are you um, Mexican? Yeah, I am, I said. How come I didn't know that? I'm sorry, said Karen's friend, who was blonde and pretty. What do you mean? I asked. It seems like I should have known that before I've seen you play. It's before you know you're a punk band. I never thought of you being all of you being anything other than that. Oh yeah, I said. I feel bad. She reached out and touched my knee. I didn't know what to say. Identity is so important and I didn't even see it. See you. I just saw Squid Boy. I don't think that's uncommon, I said. It's just easier to see the short hair and the clothes, I guess. Well, I'm not going to do that again, she said. It's not right. After so many years of race and class and ridicule that I endured growing up in Tuolumne, fitting in was important to me, but fitting in into the punk scene the way I did then created whole other problems. In conforming to the non-conformist punk ways, adhering mostly to the punk uniform, I had lost something along the way, and I began to experience rumblings of discontent that I didn't quite understand. I secretly listened to Linda Ronstadt's Conformist in Depravity and sang along, holding long, sad notes to words that, like Ronstadt, I only vaguely understood. I knew that my identity was the root of my confusion and discontent. And so I began taking Spanish classes at a local community college when I could fit them in after work. Learning to speak Spanish had been a lifelong dream. As a child, someone had given me a red hardcover Spanish-English dictionary, and naively, I thought if I read it every night before bed, that I would become bilingual like the rest of my family in East LA. Later, living in the Bay Area and not being able to speak Spanish began messing with my head, made me feel inadequate, not bony. I sometimes avoided going to the Mission District in San Francisco because while I was working super hard to fit into the punk scene, playing in bands, going to shows, volunteering at Blacklist, and not always feeling totally accepted or understood, I felt really out of place in the mission, where it seemed like everyone spoke to me in Spanish and looked baffled when I couldn't respond. Learning to speak my family's language, even the little that I was able to speak after only a couple of semesters of college Spanish provided some relief and help me to come out of a, as a person of color in punk. Oh, all right, thank you for that. It was nice to, was nice to read from my book. Yeah. I haven't done that in a minute. So. Right, same. That was good, that was good. Um, so I thought we'd open up a couple of points of things we want to cover. So I'll kind of jump, we'll go back and forth like that. And if you, again, like if you have any, Thing to add or questions in it, please feel free to, to bring it up. Um, so one of the things I think we had talked briefly about was, and this is a nice segue from our writing into kind of like the literary you know, like role models that we have as writers or as readers, um, and not necessarily even in the writing community. Maybe you want to speak to a couple of those. And then... My literary role models? Sure, yeah. So um, I think that early on, you know, I started writing about dystopian literature, like 1984 and Margaret Atwood Handmaid's Tale. I'm still totally obsessed with dystopian literature. I went on to write you know, my dystopian novel. But um, in the 90s, in the time period that this book was written about, I actually was reading a lot of Alice Walker then. I read probably every book that I could get my hands on that Alice Walker wrote at the time. Um, being um, a Latina, Chicana who doesn't speak Spanish fluently, I felt very connected to the African American experience because I don't know, there, you know, there was something about it. I just felt really connected. Also, it was very, I live in a small town, and there weren't that many Latino people, and there, there weren't that many. There, there were like two black kids in the whole high school, but somehow I just felt rather connected to the African-American experience. So I read a lot of African-American literature. And I think I also just wanted to learn about people who were different from me that had similar experiences. That was very comforting. Um, and I didn't have to deal with the Spanish stuff, you know? So I, <laughs> and then later on, I um, started reading a lot of um, Ana Castillo yeah. and San Desisteros. But you know, they're, they're, they're great role models because they're published writers. and. 
such great writers, but I, um, you know, I, I, I didn't go to Mexico until 1986. I'm not a fluent Spanish speaker. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know anything about Catholicism hardly or, you know, corn goddesses or, you know, it just wasn't my experience. Um, a third generation Mexican American, a third generation Chicana. So my experiences, which I now realize I needed to write about in order for them to be written about so that people didn't think that being Mexican was like some of experience, um, is the experience of a person growing up in California who's not bilingual, who's third generation, who's fully Chicana, which is a whole different thing than being Mexican American. Who's am I married to an ex Mexican national and he's like, that's not real Mexican food. And I'm like, you're right, it's not. This is Chicano food. This is the Chicano version. And if you want to eat, that's what you're going to get. Eat, right? Okay? So um, it is a very different culture. And it's one that um, is really like a separate, beautiful, totally separate thing. And it's a lot of things. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, as you were speaking, was it reminding me of like thinking about like the Latino writers that for me kind of like, because I, again, Carla Castillo, Sandra Cicero, I read those things, I love them, but I was really desperate for stories that were coming from like different perspectives. So I wrote down here, uh, Michael Nava was a queer detective writer, because I love detective fiction at the time, like, you know, like Thomas Harris, The Silence of the Lambs, but we read those, I just devoured those. And so when I came across a Chicano writer writing in detective fiction, I was just like, I read everything that he wrote. And he's still writing right now, and I really appreciate it. I was thinking of like, I don't know, gee, but I still, with poetry, is that something that you did as well? I was just like, I felt I like I was writing poetry. Right. And that was my first, when I went to Mills to start, um, I went back to school and I was a little later. So my bachelor's degree, my focus was English and creative writing. And I started as a poet, but I was in the, you know, I was in Spit Boy and I was, um, I wrote about a little less than half of all the lyrics. Mm -hmm. And so like, I was always a writer and, you know, short form lyric writing is very similar to poetry. You get away with a lot more with lyrics, though. You know, <laughs> being a lot simpler. Um, so I did. I did read a lot of poetry right. because I was writing a lot of it early on, for sure. And I wrote. A, I read a lot of the Chicano poets, for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking about too. And it's funny because we both teach in. Well, we I taught in Puente. You do teach in Puente, mm -hmm. which is a, a program in community colleges. And like Jimmy Santiago Baca was there constantly. And I just remember loving the the narrative about masculinity and. He also wrote about being a young father, and having those kind of like you know, the beauty of poetry was so important for my own writing later on. As I started to think about the, the kind of stories I wanted to tell, those those moments of kind of being of intimacy between men and friendships and stuff. So like yeah, those I did appreciate poetry early on, particularly the podcast. I do really think early on as a writer, when I started writing prose, that I thought that I had to write about the urban Chicana right. experience. Like I really, I wrote several short stories that I was trying to capture this version of me that wasn't me because I'm not an urban Chicana. I didn't grow up that way. And they, the stories never worked. Well, why didn't they work? Because I just, that wasn't my experience, you know? And I, you, you still need to bring what you know to fiction as much as you can to render it, make it really feel really real and and um, for, for people to connect to it. Even people who are different from you are going to connect when you write from a really real place, right? I think we all know that. Um, I, I, it took me a while to learn how to do that. I had to start writing memoir first before I was able to do it in fiction. Well, the, the, maybe this brings up the next point I wanted to bring up, which is uh, about the experience of being an artist who's taken non-traditional Kind of avenues towards the publishing that we've been doing because I think both you and I come from different, well, similar ones, but like not, we didn't go directly from high school to you know, college, or I'm not sure if that was your experience, but it wasn't necessarily yeah. mine, and then to an MFA program and then writing to publishing. Like that was not what I, think I did, and I know it's not what you did as well. So maybe once we get a little bit of that. Then... I started City College, I was in a punk band. City College, City college of San Francisco, I was in a punk band, dropped out after a month. <laughs> Okay, well, collected, a couple of, <laughs> collected a couple of those checks that you get and, <laughs> yes. and then dropped out. Um, I went back to school later. Well, right. I wanted to say, you know, you, you, you posed this question, but why don't you start? Because what I was thinking about was like, as, as 
Chicanos, we, there's no other way but a non-traditional rapper or a Chicano writer. I mean, there just isn't. Yeah. So what, what, how did you start out? Um, that, you know, I came, I did a lot of like the self-publishing zine community. That was where I started. And I don't even know why I, I feel like as a, like I said, as I was a young parent and I had, there was not a lot of community and I was in Santa Barbara at the time. And somehow I came across a zine that was, I don't even know what it was about anymore, but it just, it just, um, it just gave me the opportunity to think about, um, what I wanted to do, because I was I was writing on my own, but I was never considered ever publishing anything. And oh, you know what it was? It was Hip Mama. That's what it was, because I was looking desperately looking yes. for like non traditional ways to parent my son differently than the way I was paying, parented. And so gave me a zine of Hip Mama and, and this other uh, zine called the Future Generation. And these were all his parenting ones, but they were of course you know women. And so I was really wanting to try and figure out how to kind of talk about parenting my son and parenting as a father. And so that's kind of where I did it. And I just started publishing zines in that, not even, and I say publishing means like me stapling and like trading <laughs> and like, you know, spending $47 and printing them and making, I, I don't think I made zero dollars in the first like 10 years of putting out my zines and stuff. So that was kind of, and that's how I started. And, then, and, and from there, I mean, that's, you know, doing the hustle work of getting the zines into bookstores, Tower Records, I think I brought them too as well. They bought, I remember Tower Records bought the first 40 copies. <laughs> I was like, I felt like I was a bestseller. I was like, <laughs> man, things are going far now, right? But, but uh, yeah. I mean, zine writing, doing that gave you access to like this kind of like, you know, alternative publishing, which also taught you about regular publishing. But it also probably, because this is similar to like me writing punk lyrics and putting out punk records and having that audience, it probably gave you opportunity to practice in what could be considered, shouldn't be, but what could be considered in a lower stakes way, right. right? Yeah. Well, it also it gave you a certain, like, probably fake confidence of, like, I can just put it out. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be approved by anyone. And I think there's a certain sense of, like, for me, I gained a sense of, like, my story stories worth sharing with other people because like, then the best thing was that the people would you know give me their scenes and then we'd share letters and so it really felt like i was crafting my voice and my story on my terms as opposed and with in conversation with other people who were doing similar things and to me that benefit that has been you know in, in some ways it's now that i'm working you know in a, a little bit of more of the mainstream kind of publishing world it's actually hard to like it's ready to go out now. Why it doesn't have to be perfect? Let's just put it out. That's you know, it's that conversation that's important, not necessarily the end product, because we all know we can edit and edit and edit. Um, so in some ways, I think it, it did it did provide a sense uh, a sense of it's okay to not like, it's okay to make a mistake, right? And usually, because you'll get there. And you didn't wait around for some Columbus to come and discover you. Yeah, exactly. There we go. <laughs> that's, that's nice. I like that. Right. I said that. Before, <laughs> it's a good line. It bears repeating. Right. And it's also one thing that's interesting too. I like to say this because I often I get asked about um, you know how I get to, to write. Like I and I think that in some ways I was just like I. I wanted an MFA because I wanted the community, but I realized for me what was important was like I could do, I could find that community, meeting people like Michelle, doing events, readings like this, and that's kind of what I, I felt like I needed at that time. Um, and so that's just a nice reminder that there's not, there's other ways to come to writing besides the MFA program, which of course, when I met tons of people who have them, Michelle included, you did one as an older student, right? Well, like a returning student? Yeah, I was a returning student at Mills College. I got my MFA there. I graduated. 2001 as an undergrad and went right back to right back to Mills and I graduated in 2003 with an MFA in English and creative writing and they do both wow. which is really cool because I wanted to prepare you for for um, teaching as well because you only know you only know it's hard to be a writer um, but I was uh, pregnant with my son when I who's 19 now who, when I um, first started the graduate program actually I was pregnant when I graduated as an and I had him during Thanksgiving, which 
feels like a major accomplishment because I had him on Thanksgiving, basically 25 minutes after Thanksgiving. And then a week later, I took him in the sling in the classroom and just nursed him after the sling for the last week of school. And then I had a month off and went right back. So, <laughs> so I, wasn't a, I wasn't a young parent like Tomas, but I, I did have my son when I was in college. It was kind of a trip, you know, yeah. getting the MFA. And I did meet a lot of people, but I don't think that, I mean, the MFA did connect me somewhat, but and it prepared me to teach writing and it prepared me to be a writer to a certain extent. But the things that more prepared me to be a writer were writing groups, writing groups yeah. being in writing groups, joining Literary Kitchen with Ariel Gore, Hit Mama. I mean, she has inspired both of us. Yeah. And now we're the two of us are in a writing group with her. And how long have we been in the writing group? Or, a long I, time. It's been like five years yeah. or something. <laughs> I mean, we've totally lost track. Like five or six years or something. Right. Um, the cool thing about writing groups, and you should all take note, you know, writers, is that um, it doesn't have to be a competition. Right. You know, like what Tomas learned or what Ariel learned about where to publish and how to write the cover letter for so and so right. or this magazine or this magazine is looking for. You know, Latinx writers and Ariel would turn us on to that because she heard it because she was looking for something else. It's a, it, it is a community in which you can really support each other, and then we read each other's work with with all of what we know in mind. And um, you know, a writing group is you know is such a beautiful like non capitalist thing that we can right. do yeah. um, and you know, really support each other as writers. And it, it, that that probably, I think all the writing group work that we've done together in the Literary Kitchen has been my avenues to most of my publishing more than mill, more than, you know, the, the program that I'm still paying for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now I was thinking about that, it's really powerful to think about like the, how the writing group has evolved and there's various things that we've needed. We've seen each other more, we've seen each other less. It's been an interesting kind of way to stay in the process of writing, particularly through, you know, obviously all of us have gone through the last year and a half as the pandemic has hit and it's been a really nice Yeah, we, so um, about two years ago, Ariel moved back to New Mexico and she was like, well, I guess I can't be in the writing group anymore. We were like, what about modern technology? We're going to Skype you in or whatever. Right. We didn't, I guess we didn't know about it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember, but so she started, you know, I think we were using Facebook or something. I don't remember what we were using. Uh, FaceTime. FaceTime. We were FaceTiming her in for a while. And then the pandemic hit, and then we all had to Zoom in. We figured out how to learn to use Zoom. So, right, you know, you can be in writing groups with people all over the world now, which is really even, even better in yeah. a way. You know, you don't have to, like, you don't have to drop out of your writing group, is what I'm saying. You, know, you can do it from, from, from anywhere. Um, you can do it from vacation. Which I've done. I don't know I'm not done that from vacation. I think, I think one well, of at least one of us has, yeah. Well, maybe this is a segue to the, the other question I wanted to talk about because in writing groups, we've been having these conversations about how to create characters, diverse characters, Latinx characters, characters in our own stories. And so I know Michelle just did a, yeah, a conversation around our workshop. Around it, do you want to speak more to that one as well? Yeah, so I've been giving this talk, um, I'll be giving it again at Las Vegas College on May 9th for our Literary Arts Festival. Las Vegas College um, now has an annual Literary Arts Festival. This year it'll be mostly on campus with some events online. And um, it's the talk is um, how to write the other without right. appropriation or stereotyping. And I gave it to the Tri Valley Writers Club, and they posted it on their webpage. And right after, like three or four other people contacted me right away and asked me to give it to their writing group. And I, it's a talk I give to my creative writing students because I do teach creative writing at Los Angeles College. And and it's a talk. It's like a version of various things I say throughout the semester to my students. Um, and it is a fraught topic of writing the other. And you know, yes, you know, writing is made up largely, so you can write anything you want. But should you is the question, or when should you, or why shouldn't you? I mean, there there are times when you shouldn't. And um, it's such a fraught topic that people really want to know more about it. Um, Alexander Chi has a great essay on it um, called "Writing the Other Something Something Else." I did borrow his title a little bit. 
And um, his article is really great. Um, he gives really, he, he tries not to give advice, he tries to ask people to ask questions. And he poses some questions. And one of, I think, the most important questions that he asks is um, why um, you need to ask yourself, why do you want to write from this perspective, this different from yours? And do you even read writers from those backgrounds? In other words, do you know anything right. about? People from those backgrounds, like truly, really, like real knowledge, not like I Googled some shit, right. my French, but not just I Googled a few things, right? And so, um, I don't know, a lot of the framing of my talk, because it, I'm very honest about it in the talk, what comes up is that people of color, we have to, we learn to fit in. We learn to fit into the dominant culture. So we have to become insider outsiders and observers. And so it might be easier for us to write people who are different from us because we have to fit into all these different situations, right? And we have had to observe them and figure them all out, right? And see ourselves from other people's eyes all the time, which is really, you know, kind of freaky. Um, and so that that creates tension because then you say to white folks, maybe you shouldn't write from another perspective, or maybe you should be careful. That creates friction because then people say, well, if it's just made up, can't I, you know, do anything I want? It's a free country, you know, on and on and on. But um, my professor, one of my professors at Mills, who was a visiting professor, um, Leonard Chang, he lectures free now. He said, um, when a student asked this a very similar question about, well, why can't I write about Japan and Japanese characters? I just love the culture so much. And the girl started crying, the woman started crying. I just sat there like trying not to make a face. And he said, okay, if you're gonna write about people who are really different from you, the most important thing is this, don't F it up. And I always quote him, because I was like, oh my God, he really railed on this woman. But I had to spend a lot of time thinking about what he meant. And what he meant was, as writers, we have to take responsibility for what we put out into the world. That is our responsibility. You put it on the page, you have to be responsible for it. And that is a lot of responsibility. And you have to take that very seriously. So that's a lot of what I've been talking about in terms of representation and um, I kind of don't want to be the person to give that talk, but I feel like someone needs to do it. And um, I, feel, I feel like I can do it in a way that's gentle and fair. And a lot of what I do talk about is something that I really truly believe, and that is that writing is a spiritual thing for me. And that if you treat writing as an expression of our common humanity, and that is your primary goal, then you want and you want to write about people who are different from you, always come back to that. Always come back to the human, common humanity. Base characters who are different from you on people who you actually know and who you actually like and bring their humanness to the page. So those are some of the things. Yeah, no, that's a nice one. Yeah, I mean, as you were talking, I was thinking a lot about the ways in which it's, it is a huge responsibility. And it's almost, it can be almost a silencing one. Like it's, because you don't want to make mistakes. You don't want to, but you do need to find that balance between taking a risk and trusting the story. And, but the answer yeah. is not don't write other people of color and invisibilize them. That's yeah. not the answer. No. Also. No, exactly <laughs> right. So that's the that's and that's a, you know I'm speaking from my own experience writing characters even in this book or in other books. It's like it's this constant sense of like self reflection. Um, you know, doing the work of asking. I, I the best bit of advice I always got was like. To, what your first choice is in terms of like how someone may, let's say, react in a certain situation, then the, when you revise and you come back to that, is like, is, is that like how is that the, you know, how can you push beyond your initial you know, assumption or how something happens? Like the best bit of yeah. editing I got from someone in the, not this book, it was a previous book I was working on. But someone said, you know, do you realize that in all in all your female characters in your book, anytime they get upset, they cry. And I was like, ooh, like I. Is that true? No, that's not. And I like, had to go through it and I realized that this is so like, you know, that being upset, getting frustrated, getting angry, these are common things. Now that may be the way in which 
that I deal with my frustration and anger. So I just kind of put it all on top of these characters, or maybe it's the certain stereotypes I have about characters I'm trying to create. So like asking those kind of tough questions after you've written the manuscript, but giving yourself the space to kind of create the work and then do that, to take the responsibility to do the editing that needs to happen. To get yeah, you don't need to get nutted up about it right. in your first draft. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You don't need, I mean, that is not what I'm, what I'm asking. Um, or expecting, and, and in fact, you know that that could you know make you give you kind of like anxiety about writing, right? It's, 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 right, it's hard enough already, right? It's it's hard is, enough already. It is a challenge. Right? Um, do you want to talk a little bit about your future projects um, that like, I read a little bit of in your in your book? Yeah, right. So, well, my the Spitboy World. This was published in 2016, but it just came out this year in Japan, which I'm really what? excited about. Isn't it pretty? And you know, you read it this way. It's published by a small publisher by, called Grey Window Press in Japan, so that's very exciting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I just, I did just finish. Um, is there a Spanish version of this? No, there isn't. I mean, there is somebody who's trying in Spain, yeah, but there isn't yet. Yeah, there should be, right? I know that seems kind of obvious. But, um, so I am working on. Um, I'm doing the last, last, last kind of edits to the dystopian novel called Republic of California, the one about Mexico. My writerly obsession is definitely Mexicans and punk rock, and there is um, uh, a punk rock band who smuggles people out of this evil cal futuristic California in, in that book. And um, I'm also writing a textbook about um, a linguistic justice textbook that reframes the freshman composition course and tries to um, create a freshman composition course that invites the sonics of black and brown queer, disabled students and voices into, into scholarly writing in a way that is both implicit and explicit, and um, in a way that challenges standardized edited American English, or that's called neck level English. And then, yeah, I'm, I wrote a couple treatments for screenplays, um, so I'm interested in screenplay writing, just because I, I just like the challenge of learning a new, um, since I do have an MFA, like I do feel comfortable trying to learn like a new, I, I like that process of learning a right. new um, genre a lot. How about you? What are your next projects? Uh, do you want to? Oh no, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, next projects. I'm I'm curious about this one because I've got a couple manuscripts I've been working on. It's been lots of fun. Lots of fun. I feel, I, I feel like I've really been trying to to talk about intimacy and friendship. That's kind of where I'm trying to go with this next one. I got a story, it takes place in San Francisco, in the mission, and it's got an older character, and it's got a young young woman character, and they're just kind of, they're kind of running through, it's a month in the life of running through the mission, so it should be a fun experience, I've been trying to, to get that nailed down. Um, yeah, that's about it. Um, <clears throat> we do have a question from YouTube, awesome. Nathan, if you want to repeat it, just so they can hear it. They're asking Michelle, you also write about parenthood as well. The they question. also they also said they love the reading suggestions and they love when authors talk about who they <clears throat> who they read and who you know lists of that. But do you also write about parenthood? Um, the question is, does Michelle also write about <laughs> parenthood? You know, I have written about parenthood. In fact, that's how Tomas and I met. Yeah. Um, he just cold emailed me, and he was like. I'm Tomas Moniz and I do Rad Dad and <laughs> I heard about you and like and like you know you're in a band I was wanted to know I heard you I know you have a child I wanted to know if you wanted to write something for Rad Dad and so um that was like one of the first parenting pieces that I wrote I think and maybe I had written something for I written a couple of parenting pieces for Hit Mom magazine which inspired Tomas and but you know i never wanted to i think early on when i started writing parenting stuff i actually resisted even though it was a comfortable thing to do in a lot of ways i resisted the urge to do parenting writing because it is a thing that like that whole mommy blogger yeah. thing like i just really kind of felt resistant to that and some of that is like my like you know my art MFA probably coming out of me I'll be honest you know I think it has a little bit to do with that but I also just that are, that are a lot more like 
I don't know, heady or cutting that way. But that's not usually what people right. want. Right. And I think that's one of the reasons I asked you is because for me, it's someone I was really trying to get different voices to talk about parenting because it was such a limiting, you know, mainstream kind of like someone who was in a band and someone who's, you know, a single parent and someone who's like queer, right? These are the stories I think I wanted to hear about as, a, as you know, trying to be a better parent myself. But then I think I take that, both of us take that same type of a, a philosophy in terms of the story we're trying to create, getting characters that are bringing different kinds of perspectives into our stories. And what I wrote about was how I only had one child, right? That was the decision I made that I had one child, I think is what I wanted to write about. I think that is right. Yeah. So Although I might have asked you to write about Riot Girl, but I got in trouble when I asked about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the funny story. Yeah. You thought I was a Riot Girl. I wasn't really, I was in a punk band, all women, but I wasn't a right girl. Right, right, right. my bad, I'm sorry. That's okay, that's um, okay. We still like to teach. Yeah, 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 I, I appreciate it. Well, we have a few minutes left, and so I'm wondering if there's anyone has any questions on, uh, in, in the room or on YouTube. And people wanted reading suggestions of things we're reading right now. Okay, all right. So if you can think of something, Jim. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask about, uh, are you writing about uh, uh, related to adult children? It seems pretty popular to want to divorce one's parents. Uh -huh. um, and uh, so anyway, if you heard about the parenting experience, I was wondering if you have written about that. I missed the first part about, uh, about navigating adult uh, relationships with adult children. Yeah, that's actually, no, I have not written about that recently, though clearly that's a story that should be, people should be writing about. So write about it. I'd love to read it. I'm reading about it and uh, I'm living it. Okay, there you go. My, my daughter-in-law. Didn't want the whole family to get yeah. on my son, and, uh, yeah. it's very, very hard. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so now you were saying that you, when you write, it's always better to write from your personal experience, but do you ever find yourself writing like about the main character and putting your entire backstory <laughs> and then realizing like, oops, this is a mirror? Yeah. <laughs> or the backstories of other people. <laughs> Well, you know, like amalgamations of different people's experiences and like turning those into like one person and combining some of my own stuff. Sure. I mean, like a lot of my characters have different aspects of my own experiences, but not usually like the full thing. Like I'll fix out, fixate on like one part of my experience will be a part of that person's background. Because it, it helps you feel closer to the characters when you do that and it helps you like start to understand them a little more. Yeah, I agree. I do the same thing. In fact, I just like to see my little bits of my own experience or thoughts coming through the characters. That's why sometimes it's tough to have characters that you start writing and feel that like you kind of like and then you know you put it in a position of trying to you know write characters who make poor choices, right? I, in fact, in this book, one of the hardest things I had to deal with was a couple scenes where I, the father is kind of a jerk to the daughter. I was never a jerk to my children, <laughs> ever, <laughs> right? So the hat, but to sit in that moment of like, this is a mistake, this person, I can see that this character is making a mistake and not want to write the best version of myself into like all the characters. Is, that's actually what I really struggle with is like sitting in just like, this is a bad moment here. Right. Exactly. With my memoir, like, you have to write, you know, it's, it's nonfiction, so it has to all be true and real, right? It has to have actually happened. But so I was writing about my band members and about me being the only person of color in the punk band, and I didn't want to spoil the band for anybody, but I did want to critique some of the relationships, and I did want to critique punk. Um, but I realized kind of early on that some of the stories made people sound bad and I was, I, I looked great and everyone else looked bad. <laughs> and it took me a while to figure out like, well, I mean, I, I thank goodness I have an MFA because you know, the, one of the most important things you learn is that you have to make fully rounded characters of everybody. Even if it's a true story, the characters have to be fully rounded characters. They can't be flat and that everyone is flawed and you have to bring that out. And then I remember, okay, what were my flaws? What did I do in the band that was annoying me? How did I participate in the friction in between the band members? And I, I had to like sit down and like make a little list, you know, of 
And it wasn't easy. Like I was like needy and like I'd follow people around who were more confident than I was. And I was probably quiet and needy and you know, stuff like that. So I had to figure out what that was in order to bring that out so I can balance it. Um, the, the depiction. I have a couple of Zoom questions. Oh, One good. is, Michelle, do you have a publisher for your dystopian book? <laughs> I do ish. Um, I have someone who's interested in it, and um, I'm really hoping that they publish it. So, you know, I think I will keep turning it out to until, you know, I have made the mistake in the past of thinking that someone was, was going to take it and then it didn't work out for another book. And then not sending it to agents in the interim. And you really should just always be querying people because you never know what's going to happen, what's going to fall through. You never know if there's going to be a pandemic or, you know, whatever. <laughs> so you should always be um, actively sending your work out, even if you think you have a good thing. Because, um, I mean, maybe for some people that matters because you want to get the best deal, or maybe, I think maybe in reality, it's less about the, the, the best deal. Because publishing isn't super duper lucrative. I mean, unless you wrote American Dirt and it's all stereotypical, and that's what people want to read, right? Um, but you should always, you know, just be querying and, and, and preparing. Um, it's not about so much the money, but as, you know, just the fact that life happens and things fall apart and fall through um, very easily. So um, you shouldn't just bank on one thing. So yeah, I, I, I think I do. I hope I do. Um, and um, I think I have a good draft. To share with that person. <laughs> Omas, um, Big Familia is fiction. Mm -hmm. And the question is how much of that is memoir? <laughs> uh, all of it and none of it. Uh, what a, half of it and the other half. No, after. <laughs> There's a, it, no, it's fiction. And, and it's, I mean, it's definitely informed by my choices as, you know, my experience, I should say. But yeah, no, that was part of the pleasure. And in some ways, the, the, the fraught nature of writing fiction is that um, as I started, like Michelle, doing mostly nonfiction, and so I knew, you know, what the parameters of the story is, were that I, I had to fit in, right? I had to really kind of be honest. And, but with fiction, it was a little bit more like I can, I can change things. I can, I can uh, alter the way in which certain characters um, that I want them to act, but I can make them act differently. So, it, it was a, it was both liberating and a little bit frightening, and you know, obviously, there's got a lot of my experiences in it, but it's not. It's fiction. And in order to move a plot forward, often the characters do have to act differently yeah. than the way you acted in real life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, given that your son now has a daughter, are there any plans for Rad Granddad? <laughs> Rad Granddad. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Uh, yes. Think about it. I don't think thank you. I, I want to do Red Granddad child book, kid book. There we go. Collaboration coming up. There you go. So, uh, yeah, that's great. I'm a granddad. Yes. Oh, I want to ask you about writing um, nonfiction. Um, what advice did you get about protecting yourself legally from the other living people in the forest? I didn't get any advice. I mean, <laughs> I mean you know, I had some concerns with this book and I talked to the publisher about him and the publisher was like, I'm not concerned about that. Mm -hmm. um, there were a couple of things and he, they were like, we're not concerned about that at all. You shouldn't worry about it. And I trusted them and you know, they have people, so they, they know better than I do. Um, when you're telling your story, you get to be in charge of your story. And Yes, it's a fraught thing when you write about real people who are part of your story. Um, I think one, one of the things that happened to me early on, so I wrote a whole memoir about growing up in Tuolumne where I grew up, and it's not been published, but I published it all online now on a blog a long time ago. And my mom read a lot of it. And my mom is a main character in it. And my mom, you know, suffered with drug addiction for many years when I was growing up. And, you know, a lot of the stories are about that. And um, I asked her about it once, and we, we had a really frank discussion, a couple of them. And finally, in the final discussion, she said to me, Michelle, everything that you wrote 
about me and everything else totally happened and is totally true. And I don't want you to do anything but tell the truth. And so from my own family's perspective, they have been very like, my family is not a secretive family. So I think I'm very lucky. I do have friends whose families are secretive. So I think that would be a different conversation. But I, I think I felt very lucky because I've kind of been given permission by my family to be honest. Um, and they, I think they, for them it's healing, but I know that's not the case for everyone. So sad. Yeah. My, I have one thing to consider that was funny because as, as someone writing about children, like in, in retrospect, I like have apologized to my son because I don't think I, I asked him early on. And like, you know, when I was when I was still just figuring out how to write and I'd write about my experience parenting him, but you know, without his permission to share some source. And at some point I realized like I, I needed to clear whatever I was gonna write and share about parenting with my children before I made it available to the public. And so my daughters have all been able to be like Absolutely, you're not telling that story. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, unfortunately, my son wasn't able to get the, that uh, that ability. So, but so I learned that lesson. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Any final question? Yeah. Any future projects for either of you that you're working on? That you're excited about? Mm -hmm. You've got your dystopian novel. I'm really excited about that, and I'm really excited about. I'm really, honestly, I'm really excited about the textbook. I feel like. Right. I feel like I'm writing it with uh, my two colleagues, my colleagues, Bishop Michelle Turner and Karen Spurn, and I feel like there's a lot of theory about linguistic justice um, in the classroom, but there is not any curriculum in the practices. And uh, to my knowledge, this will be the first college composition, full semester of college composition textbook that then has lessons and essays and examples of what progression and linguistic justice looks like in practice. So I'm really, really excited about that. Yeah, and I think, I'm, like I said, my I've been really, like, I've had a really good time and experience, like, trying to craft a um, character who's aging right, and becoming older and letting things go and, you know, dealing with regret and remorse, but also kind of celebrating that kind of survival by getting there so that's been and as i'm looking down that path i'm beginning to say this is kind of how do i want to age how do i want to become you know the grandparent that i want to be and stuff like that so that's been my that's my project right now yeah a lot of um older people write about younger people for a long time and older people really need to be written about yeah. we really need to write about our experience our elders yeah as 50 something year olds or Grand, granddads. Rad granddads. Rad granddads, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Excellent. Well, anything else from YouTube land or we can wrap it up? And I would just say normally we could mingle, but I guess we don't mingle anymore. We can mingle from like, you mingle know. Mingle from afar. Room. Social distant mingling. I yeah. brought some zines. They're, this is all free. free. They're from Razor Cake Magazine. I did an interview with the most famous yes. Latino punker in the whole world, Martin Sorendegui from Los Crudos. So the interview there, this is an interview with me from the magazine. So those are free. You can YouTube and Zoom are sending claps and thank you for <laughs> the wonderful time. Aww. They're also wondering if the publisher can attend the workshop on writing about the other. Um, can a publisher attend the writing? Uh, yes, go to the Los Cositas College website and type Lit Festival. And you'll find out more information about the Lit Festival. I believe that my talk is already been announced. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate it. Bye, you guys. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Stop it from mingling. Oh, hey. <laughs> Thank you. We got some chocolate. Green, green, green. Don't want to say your name.